Okay, morning. We seem to be slightly down on numbers. As the term progresses, we get thinner. Where are the absent people? I'm talking to you. Right. So, second last lecture. So this is the one that covers the last section in one of the assignments you can answer on common factors. And so this is what we're going to look at today. What are the common factors? At the end of the lecture, the student engagement officer is going to come in and uh, do module evaluation for this module as well. So it's important we get that feedback because it's part of improvement of a course. So we're looking at what are the different common factors uh, to describe some of the common factors and the different approaches. What are some of the models and methods from the common factors approach? And what to evaluate them as a unifying force within counseling? How can the common factors act as a combining element? So, within counseling training, you're being trained in different skills, different abilities, different ways of thinking. Okay? So, you already have some of these core skills that you're developing through the counseling skills relationship understanding, empathy, ability to communicate, trust, respect of the client, working with them in a helping, caring, manageable manner. Okay. But lots of research studies have increased the understanding of what works. We know that the elements that we teach you in the counseling skills module work. And that's been shown again and again in research. Mm -hmm. But it's also increased confusion as to what works. So we have a study saying X works, then we have another study saying, but Y works. You know, it's like the advice you get on diets. Oh, you shouldn't eat X. Oh, no, you should eat butter. You shouldn't eat margarine. People say, well, you should eat margarine and not butter. Now, you should drink red wine, you shouldn't drink red wine. It's the same kind of thing with counseling knowledge. What works becomes quite a confusing story. There's conflicting information out there. And it makes it very difficult to follow. Well, what are you supposed to do? So, what ends up being done is what's called a meta-analytic research. Meta-analytic. It's a study of studies. Okay? So if you see the term meta-analytic, they're not doing primary research. They're going and gathering all the research that's been done and analyzing that research. So if you ever see meta-analysis, they are good articles to read. Because they are summarizing a whole bunch of other articles. They often provide a good summary, a good conclusion of an area of research. So if you see a meta-analytical or a meta-study or a metadata analysis, it's a study of a study. So you're with me on that idea. So somebody's taken 10 studies on CBT and looked at how those studies have been run and comes up with an answer about those elements. So they're very good because those meta studies bring a period of research together. They're quite difficult things to do because you really have to understand your research theory. All right, so does research, does psychotherapy work? Yes, otherwise we wouldn't be teaching it. <laughs> you wouldn't be here. We all have a belief in that it works. Between 40 to 70% of clients who receive therapy show substantial benefits. That's quite a range, 40 to 70. No? Many therapies. Isn't that what therapies? 
most clients benefit to a greater or lesser degree. At the end of therapy, the average treated person is better off than the average untreated person. And that's what the, the research tends to show. That on average, if somebody goes into therapy for a general problem, they get come away feeling better. It helps. That compared to a person who didn't receive any therapy. So the meta-analytic studies come up with a number of factors. And what they account found was what's called the extra therapeutic factors account for 87% of the change. These are factors outside of therapy. Extra therapeutic factors. Factors that are beyond your control or not within the therapeutic realm account for 87% of the change. Next. Factors beyond our control as a therapist account for the change. So your client deciding to get divorced is beyond your control. That's an extra therapeutic factor. No. We only have control over 13% of the different factors. Yep. Yeah. Are we very helpful at all or not? Would be. Yeah. That's what I call the role that therapy plays is what I call a tipping point. It plays a crucial tipping point in moving people along particular paths at particular moments. And you'll be quite surprised by the kinds of things that clients take on board. What you think might have been a good intervention just goes straight over the head and makes no difference. But what you might have given as an offhand comment has a major impact. And I had a client actually give me that feedback. It was at the end of a couple sessions where I thought I had done a brilliant session. And I just sort of in passing said to him, you know, you cannot make him what he's not. He is who he is. You need to accept him for who he is. That had a bigger impact than the whole structured intervention that I'd done in the session. Because she came back at the next session saying, you know, you're right. I can't change him. I need to live with how he is. And the problem between us is I want him to be something he is not. He's not going to be what I want him to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's all they accept. It. But I've done a major therapeutic work looking at different attachment theory and processes and whatever. And actually it was this offhand comment that made the difference to the change. So it's, it's that little thing that, at the right moment, is going to pay a critical shifting moment. Okay? So the therapeutic factors, and they broke them down in this study, into the therapeutic alliance, therapeutic allegiance, was another way they described it, or the therapeutic model or technique only counted 1%. So your actual approach was meaningless. 1% of making the difference. This is the argument. Why don't we just do common factors? Hmm. So, in another study, the extra therapeutic factors counted for 40%. Okay? The therapeutic alliance counted for 30%. The therapy model or technique only counted 15%. The placebo effect was 15 percent. Now you all know what the placebo effect is? No? Okay. Placebo effect is when they do what's called a double blind study. In that the person undertaking doing the study doesn't know what is the treatment and what is not. The most common is the use in medicine. So they want to test whether this pill makes a difference with this health condition. So what they get is a group of patients who have the health condition and the doctor doesn't know which pill he's giving 
and the patient doesn't know which pill they're receiving. And half the patients receive the pill, and the other half receive a placebo, a blank, a sugar pill. Eh? As it has no effect. The pill they receive has no effect on them. And to see how they improve or don't improve. And that's where the term placebo effect comes from. Because those who receive the sugar pill are suddenly reporting, Oh, I got better. It's the act of receiving something makes you feel better. And that's one of the famous experiments where th in a bar they serve non-alcoholic drinks to the customers. Every single one had been altered. They were looked and tasted like the original elements. It had the original whatever, cider and vodka and whatever on the bottles. They were all alcohol free actually. And the context said, oh, I'm really wrecked now. Well, they actually stunk cold sober. <laughs> so, placebo effect is a big one. The act of just going, irrespective of what happens, the idea of being in therapy can be curative in and of itself. Yeah. Okay, but again, our therapeutic alliance and techniques only counting for, in this study, 45%. So, what they're coming up out of these meta analytic studies is that virtually all models and techniques are effective with some people some of the time. The differences between different models are small and negligible. So, whichever orientation you take actually makes very little long term different to, to how they feel. It's a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland. You are all winners. So, outcome differences between therapists using the same model are found to be two to three times greater than the differences between models. So, therapists within the same model will have a greater difference than therapists between different models. So, those using CBT compared to other CBT practitioners will have a greater range of difference in their outcomes than when they compare CBT to integrative or vice versa. In that there is no consistency in how a therapeutic model is applied. Because at the end of the day, therapy is as much an art as it is a science. How you apply the models you are learning is the art of therapy. You each have to own your own process in the way you deliver the therapeutic approach you are going to be using. It's like wearing a suit. You need to find one that fits you. And if it doesn't, you need to tailor it so it does fit you. But that results in inconsistencies in models being applied. So the therapeutic relationship, the difference between the therapeutic relationship and therapeutic alliance is one of the elements that was picked up. And we look at the therapeutic relationship in terms of those core factors of Rogers. Warmth, trust, empathy, genuineness, kindness, respect. Yeah? That's what you would expect in any good, warm, positive, loving relationship. The therapeutic alliance is a slightly different focus point. It re relies on these elements, but this is the working component of the relationship. It's the client's emotional relationship to the therapist. How well does the client trust you or not trust you, work with you? believe in you. Okay. The client's capacity to work in therapy. How psychologically minded is the client? If the client is fairly psychologically minded, you're going to be more successful because if they're able to stop 
reflect on what's going on, think about their thinking, reflect on their feelings, and make a decision, you're going to have more successful therapy than a client who goes, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And the therapist's empathic, empathic understanding and involvement with the client is also a crucial factor. The stronger the empathic attunement, the greater the change. The more involved, the more frequently seen or involved in other more subtle ways, um, the greater the change that can come about. And this is where being creative as a therapist sometimes is needed. Sitting in a room opposite a client, doing therapy, sitting down, is not necessarily always the best place. You need to think about your client, what do they need, what will work. I've done walking therapy, I've done football therapy. Depending on who you're working with, what is needed. I had a youngster who had ADHD, he couldn't sit still, there's no way I was going to be able to talk to him in the room. So we went and kicked the football together. And as we kicked the football together, we were talking. And he could then focus on talking. Because he was busy. His busyness had been taken care of, had been contained by kicking the football. And so he could engage in the talking. And so your context will play a role in, in the kind of client and what you needed. I worked with a client who was recovering from addiction. Severe learning difficulties. I mean, he was probably the, one of the worst cases of dyslexia I've ever seen and dyspraxia. I mean, he had lived in the same neighborhood his whole life and he still gets lost because he can't figure out left from right. So go, go down the road and turn left. He'll reach the road and he doesn't know which one's left or right because of his dyspraxia. He simply doesn't have that capacity. Inability to uh, orientate yourself, have directions, catch a ball, coordination, dyspraxia. Dyslexia is not being able to read, getting words backwards, or not being able to structure things. Dyspraxia is generally seen as clumsiness in children. Can't catch a ball, are uncoordinated, but it also has larger impacts in terms of coordination, but it's also planning, structuring, orientation. They get lost. So working with him was very difficult. But what I managed to get, because I happened to stay near the hospital where I was working at the time, I got him an allotment. So we used to spend our time in therapy working on his allotment. And helping him see things in 3D terms and structuring. And slowly begin to shift how he could begin to think and engage in things. So your involvement will sometimes be crucial by bringing the difference. And for the first time in 20 years, he was able to get clean of heroin and methadone and stay clean for 10 years. That's the last time I had contact with him. He was, was 10 years ago. He was still clean. Client therapist agreement on therapy tasks and goal is another key factor. What are you working towards? You need to have clear agreement on that. Otherwise, you're working at cross purposes. You think you're aiming for one thing, they think that you're going for another, you're not going to get that. Make sure you're on target. Okay, so the therapeutic alliance is a very important element based on the warmth of the therapeutic relationship. So, this is, it's the both and are necessary for a good outcome. This is the most strong common factor. The therapeutic relationship and the therapeutic alliance make for the best difference in therapy. So choose your orientation that you are comfortable with. That fits with you. With who you are as a person. Okay, so you need to be aware that the relationship isn't a static thing, it's changing over the time, and that the therapeutic uh, relationship and alliance was more predictive of outcome than diagnosis. 
And where that's coming from was the idea that somebody with X diagnosis, their prognosis is Y. So you get that like in cancer, whatever. Oh, you've got type 1 cancer, your diagnosis is this, your life expectancy is three months. Okay? So in counseling, clients who are often diagnosed with schizophrenia, personality disorders, severe depression, or given a prognosis on how well they will do or not do, actually was belied by the, the therapeutic relationship proved more accurate. The stronger the therapeutic relationship, the stronger and more positive the outcome. So, no matter what therapy, therapeutic technique or model is used, it is not likely to be effective if there is not a strong client-therapist relationship. That's why we teach you the counseling skills and to learn those skills is key anything else you do. If you can't connect with your client, you're going nowhere. If you can't talk the language of your client in terms of being in tune with them, both in terms of how they speak, what they're speaking, and the emotions attached, you're not going anywhere fast. So, the therapeutic model or technique is only effective if it matches the client's theory of change. So, if you ask a client, what do you think will bring about the change? What do you think will make a difference? What will make you better? That's the client's theory of change. Okay? So your model and their idea of what will bring about change need to match up. Oh, I need to resolve my unresolved childhood trauma. And you're going to use CBT. You're not going to get that. Or vice versa. I just need to get rid of my negative thinking. I won't say in those kinds of terms. About being abused. I don't want to feel bad about having been abused. And you approach it from a psychodynamic point of view where we must now work through the abuse. You're not going to get there. Okay? So be aware of what does the client think about change? What's their idea of what will make them better? We all have an idea of what will make us better. If only X, Y, and Z was different, changed, shifted, then I would be better, you need to tap into that. So it's their view of the problem and their view of the change process. That's one of the things you need to ask fairly early on in a therapeutic process. So what do you think will bring about the difference? How do you think this will change or improve? So, the wider the range of choices you have, the wider the range you have in working with different clients as well. In terms of meeting that fit. So, you should be able to use a variety of models and methods instead of assuming each client will respond equally well to a particular model or technique. So, if you're integrative, you'll have a range of models and techniques. If you're CBT, you'll have a range of models and techniques that you can use. Okay? Some will work at a superficial level, right the way through to long-term, in-depth work. And you need to find the model that fits for where the client is at. Fair. Yeah. So, what do you think would make a difference if everything got fixed? What would have changed? How would it have changed? Yes, yeah. yeah. in that sense. Yeah. So you're trying to tap into, oh, if, if only my husband would spend more time with me, then I would be happier. Or if only I could get over the images that keep coming into my head about the abuse. There you've got an idea of what they're wanting to shift in order to feel better. It might be a superficial element. It might be a symptom rather than a core. 
and that's where you'll work with them. But you've got to be aware of what they seeing is going to make them better. Because if you don't meet that, then they're not going to feel better. You're working with a schizophrenic and you're trying to stabilize them and get them into some decent housing, um, get them a job, but what they want are the voices to be gone. Yeah. Not going to make any difference. It might help their lives and stabilize them and will help towards getting rid of the voices because they haven't got all the stresses of living on the street and being paranoid. But their idea of being better is when the voice is going away. And so you might have done all of this, but they would rate treatment as not helping. Because they have a particular goal, so you need to match up against the goal. Okay. So you use a model technique to fit the client. You're not trying to make the client fit a model. So he doesn't fit the bed, so we'll just chop his legs off. Okay, so it comes to how do you listen, how do you engage, how do you work with clients, okay, three styles of listening, passive listening, we listen, we're interested, but we don't communicate back. I'm here, I'm listening, but I'm not responding, it's very passive listening, it's the sort of listening you do in a lecture, which is appropriate, you're taking in, you engage. You're present, but you're not necessarily responding back. Competitive or combative listening, least effective. You're not really listening. This is where you have the yes, but arguments. Before you finish speaking, the person's already coming with yes, but. If you're getting caught in any of those arguments, just stop because it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, these are old arguments, things that you'll get caught up into. They're more interested in expressing their point of view rather than hearing yours. That's the least effective. Okay. Where this catches our trainees like yourselves in counseling is you're thinking ahead of what next question to ask and you haven't heard a word they've said because you're too anxious about what you need to say yourself. Okay. So, don't. Just be present with the client. Don't worry about what you've got to say. Don't have a list in your head of questions you think you should ask. Go with the flow. Go with the client. You need to get into their dance step. You need to be in tune with them and dancing at their pace. Because otherwise you're going to end up standing on their toes. So don't worry about got the right questions, have I framed it the right way? Slow down, be present, see the client, talk to the client, have a conversation, which is the most effective way of listening. It's an active involvement. You're listening and communicating back. It's a two-way process. You're hearing what's been said and saying what needs to be said. And it's a simple reflection process. Okay, before you ask a question in your therapy, empathize, reflect, paraphrase, then you can ask a question. Because you need to look at very carefully of how you are using questions. Questions shut down the therapeutic process. They don't open it up because invariably you're asking the wrong questions. So, build up your active listening techniques that you're learning in the skills module. Be with them, be present, and empathize, people. Reflect back and empathize are the two key elements you can do. And that, for me, is always the base I come back to whenever I get lost in an interview or a session with a client. The client's gone off on a tirade and you think, where the hell are they going? What's going on here? And you, you've lost the plot a bit. Stop. Come back. And just reflect back what you've heard and what's the feeling in what you've heard. 
So you've been speaking a lot, and and I've I've got a little lost with it. But can we just come back a moment? And so what I'm hearing you say is this, this, and this, and you're feeling really upset about. It. So a the client's hearing you're in tune with it. That's what you're trying to do the whole time. Remain in tune with the client. Otherwise, you're going to be out of step very quickly. I happened to, to um, Jane was looking at videos of the second years, um, of the, the role plays, real plays that they're doing, and I was watching this one with her, and the therapist was sitting there for 20 minutes. This is how she sat. Not a word said, not a head nodded, not a movement. We could have put a dummy there. A very, very crunchest dummy would have been more animated. <laughs> Not good. Because she got caught up in what questions she should ask. And she's caught up in her own frame of reference, is what we call it, rather than the client's frame of reference. You caught up in what I'm going to ask, am I doing this right? Not, and the anxiety level was evident on her face around it. Just relax. Just think when you're doing your videos for your, your, your skills module, you're having a conversation with somebody else. Would you sit there numb in a conversation? So just Im treat it like a special kind of conversation where you don't have a point of view. Yeah. That is the hard bit. And that's where you need to practice and practice and practice. Practice all the time. Not just in class, but outside. Practice with each other. Practice with family members. You'll be surprised how your relationships will improve when you just use a few reflective techniques at home. Or paraphrasing. You know, when the kids come, Aah! oh, so you want me to do X, right? Okay. But right now, I'm busy cooking supper, that will have to wait five minutes. Okay. They feel heard, it slows them down, because they feel you've heard them. You've given them an answer that maybe they can or can't, can't live with, but it works. As a friend of mine, she, um, who was a therapist, her husband, he, was a, he, he formed a society called Poops, Partners of Psychologists. And he said, you can say anything to a psychologist or therapist, because they don't react back. They don't, You're really upset here. What's going on? And that's, he's very right. Because it's so automatic now. When my wife's upset, I don't go bugger you and walk away and I say, what's going on with you? I reflect what I'm seeing. I'm not therapizing, but it's about the good therapeutic connection, about the empathic attunement with another human being. And you'll be surprised how people respond to that. And, and my friend used to deliberately try and provoke us by doing outrageous things, waiting for a response. He never got I He knew the game he was playing. So, use your active listening. Your core active listening skills, paraphrasing, okay? You're stating the understanding of the thoughts, feelings, and beliefs and emotions that you've heard. You paraphrase those back. So if you disagree or disapprove of what a client is saying, um partner might say, I don't think my wife should work, she should be at home looking after the kids. You might not agree with that. Okay? You need to be careful in how you hold that. You've got to remain non judgmental, accepting and respectful. Try to understand their point of view and don't embarrass or shame them. I was like, how can you say that in this day and age? Of course women work. Yeah? Or well, you fool, yeah. Okay? You might say, so for you, your wife staying at home is really important. How come? Okay? Stop reflect where he's at. You need to be on board. You need to get him on board. He needs to know that you're on board with him where he's at. Then you can begin to understand maybe the next piece that's making him say something like that. 
Because all the time that she goes out to work, only pays for the childcare. She's not bringing in any extra. It's stressful. It's demanding. She's demoralized. She's not doing a job where there's any career prospect. I'd rather that she spends her time with our child and has a good relationship with our child. You've got a very different picture. Rather than one I think of a misogynist. Okay? So it's important to get there, be on board, hear where they're coming from. Then if he is a misogynist, you need to begin a little bit of education. Okay, one of the most common errors you all do. You try to problem solve. You try to fix way too soon. You haven't even heard the full problem and you're already coming up with suggestions. We're not at an advice bureau. This is not about advice giving. Okay? The client solves their own problem. We are merely a container in which they operate. If you continue to practice the active listening, the client will begin to develop ideas of their own. They'll begin to see the problem from different perspectives. Because sometimes they might just have tunnel vision on the problem and not know that actually you just need to walk around the corner and there's a solution. Could it help them develop solutions for themselves or an approach to getting two solutions? If you fix it, it's like the old adage of give a man a fish and he'll be there tomorrow. Teach him how to fish and he'll fish for himself. Okay? You've got to teach them how to problem solve themselves. How to slow down, reflect and look at their own problems so they can make some decisions about them. Rather than you fixing it. And this is often the anxiety that a lot of trainee counsellors feel when they first begin, is that you're trying to fix the problem. It's not up to you to fix it. It's up to the client to fix it. You're merely a guide on their journey. And you have the privilege of doing the journey with them. But at the end of the day, their choice is their choice and their solution. So it's okay not to have a solution. The client's the expert on themselves. Let the client teach you and guide you. Let them build up and guide you in your journey with them. Because there are factors that you will not know about that goes on in their lives. They do not talk about. And so you can't make those decisions for them. I don't know if I've shared the example of the client who was in a domestic violence relationship with four kids. Um, she came to see me for individual therapy about breaking the cycle of violence and, and making the relationship work. Um, and eventually reached the conclusion that she couldn't do this. He was too damaged and he would not change. He wouldn't come to therapy. He wouldn't engage. So eventually she decided to leave him. Took the kids and left. And in the usual sort of divorce process, you know, kids one weekend, kids another weekend. While they were going through this process, he, be, he was very agitated and distressed by this breakdown. He proceeded to kill himself and the four children. Okay. That was her choice to leave. I asked her, is it safe to leave the children with him? I don't know why. At the end of the session, we sort of mentioned in passing that um, the kids are going to him for the weekend. I said, are you sure it's safe at this point? He's quite agitated. Are you sure it's okay to leave the kids with him? So he says, yeah, he'll never harm them. And that's when he killed them. Okay? But that was her choice. Not mine. Devastating. Devastating for her. She didn't blame me. She blamed him. So there are things that we can't change. They're beyond our control. That you have to work with. And the clients will make choices for good or for bad. A client, another client chose to stay in a dysfunctional relationship because she had no economic means by which to leave. 
and she figured out how she could make it work for herself. Okay, not the ideal, but a solution that she could live with. So you can explore the different elements um, in the therapeutic, the extra therapeutic factors, which account for a lot. So how do we make use of these? How do we make use of the factors that are beyond our control? It becomes an important way. So this is where asking about the classic question most therapists ask, how has your week been? You are checking in on those extra therapeutic factors. What has happened that's beyond your control? You know, a grandmother might have died. They might have won the lottery. And that's an important part of their process. How is your week been? Isn't merely about the therapeutic indicators. It's also about good days, bad days, what's happened during the week, what has brought about any change, is there any improvement? Okay. You need to look at if there have been changes, how have they made those changes? What's brought about those changes? Positively or negatively? Okay. How did they adopt the changes? What, what did they do to use these changes for their benefit? How will their future improve in terms of changes? Okay, so if, if there is change, positive or negative, you've got to explore it to the client as well. The client is central throughout the process. You do not have to have all the answers. So if you step off to that, that you should know an answer, it takes away a huge anxiety and stress. So when a client turns around and says, so what should I do? How do you respond to a question like that? Yeah, what do you think you should do? So what are your options? So let's explore. You're asking me what, what you should do. So what kind of answer are you looking for? If this was fixed, what do you imagine would be fixed? What is fixable? What is not? You're exploring. Because okay? what happens is, clients come in with a very narrow viewpoint of the world. They've got blinkers on. This is all they can see, is with their blinkers. They can't see what's off to the sides. And the goal of therapy is to broaden the landscape of the problem. You're trying to explore what they're seeing as the problem, which is invariably a symptom, into what actually the problem is. And so they get a richer idea of what the symptom is, what's the true problem, what's the context of the problem, and what are the alternatives available to them. Okay? It's like the drip on the ceiling. There's a, a watermark on the ceiling. Is that where the leak is? Probably not. Because this is a pitched roof. The leak could be over there. And it's running down and dripping there. That's the symptom. The problem is there. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing you're exploring with the client. They're often focused on the point where the leak is. Not the origins. And that's the important element to explore with the client. And so they get the answer. So research has shown that we're remarkably bad at judging progress of a client. Who is better at identifying whether a client is making progress in therapy? The therapist or client? And actually the client is the best person to judge their own progress. Not you. They know whether they're getting better or not, whether they're managing a situation or not. So it becomes important to assess meaningful change, especially early on in therapy. Because meaningful change within sessions by session four or five, there's a sense of some change happening. 
is a, one of the best predictors of positive outcome of therapy. If by session four or five they're still feeling negative, down, nothing's happening, nothing's changing, then you're on the wrong track somehow. Okay, and because you are doing uh, real plays, one-off real plays in the skill sessions, you're not going to experience that because you're not working consecutively with a single client. This is where you get that emplacement, and hopefully also next year when you're in your modules, even or next term even that you try and work with the same person over a period of <laughs> sessions to get a meaningful answer. Nearly done. So what is better? Who is better at accurately rating the quality of the therapeutic relationship? Again, the client. They are far superior in their rating processes of therapy rather than the therapist. Client's rating is superior to their in predicting whether they're going to drop out or not. What are indications that a client's going to drop out? Don't turn up. Late. Cancelling. Can we do it next week? So, you need to think about how you track and assess the therapeutic process overall. And that is done through a series. Ah, I've lost my track. I need 